everyone. This is Bob Tightenhoff, director of the Center for Lifestyle Medicine here at the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine in Southern California. Today is the last uh, installment of our 12 part series on being safe in an unsafe world. We've looked at a lot of different strategies, things you can do over the course of uh, these 12 presentations to be a little bit safer, both you and the members of your family. Um, we will take a look at a couple of those things just uh, retrospectively and a reminder of, of perhaps the most effective of all of the different uh, strategies that we spoke about that, uh, that you can implement in your own life. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more cheerfully about some of the things that you can do in terms of brightening your home and creating a little bit better of an environment. We're gonna be talking about house plants. Now, it may occur to you who would be really interested in uh, something like that and who would study something like um, the use of house plants in order to create a more, uh, a less toxic en environment. Um, and of course, what you would think is if somebody were to be cooped up in a small place for a long period of time and um, was exposed probably to industrial solvents and chemicals and laboratory uh, types of chemicals that can be very toxic and, and uh, outgas a, a great deal, that someone in a situation like that would probably be interested. And of course, what comes to mind is of course, anybody having to happening to live for months at a time in a place like the International Space Station. Well, in fact, it was NASA that, that uh, actually sponsored and conducted a lot of this research. And what they were primarily interested in was, um, the, was the ability of plants to clear a lot of the toxins that, um, that end up being an integral part of the manufacturing construction of a, um, uh, a fairly high-tech, um, high technology um, place like a space station. So the chemicals that they were primarily focused on were things like benzene, um, things like uh, formaldehyde, uh, ammonia, which is uh, used quite extensively, and xylene, which uh, you probably don't use that much of, but it's used in uh, laboratory settings and it's a uh, great little uh, cleaning agent. And a lot of these things are in fact used as that solvents and cleaning agents. Now they're of concern because a number of them have been shown to be highly carcinogenic. Uh, that would include formaldehyde certainly and benzene as well. Uh, not only are they um, uh, carcinogenic, but they are very, very widely used and they're widely used, not just in space station applications, but in applications around your house as well. And so that's kind of taking us full circle and bringing it back home as to why you should be concerned about these things as well. Um, formaldehyde is carcinogenic, it's odorless, so you really don't smell much of it. Um, it can be damaging. It's really uh, well taken in by the body through the air. We, we breathe it and it goes right into our systems. Like I said, it's carcinogenic. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. Where do you run into it in your house? Well, all the wall board and the particle board is, is extensively uses formaldehyde in its manufacture. Benzene <clears throat> is uh, very common. Um, in plastics, resins, synthetic fibers, uh, lubricants, detergents, drugs, pesticides, it's all over the place. It, uh, it is also considered carcinogenic to humans. Um, it's a natural product, so volcanoes and forest fires actually generate benzene as well. It's a hydrocarbon, so it's a major component of gasoline. When you go to a gas station, that's typically benzene that you're smelling. Uh, but again, it's, it's highly carcinogenic and we wanna uh, 
uh, stay as far away from it as possible. Um, ammonia is not carcinogenic, but it is highly uh, irritating to the uh, mucosal linings, the nose, the throat. Uh, also, it, uh, um, it will disrupt and irritate the linings of the lungs. Um, every once in a while, um, through the course of the summer, you, you'll see a, a story about someone who was cleaning a tank um, used for the transport of ammonia and either slipped or fell or something like that and unfortunately typically passes away because they suffocate within this uh, within the environment of heavy ammonia fumes. Uh, so it can be very very dangerous even though it's not carcinogenic and xylene also um, is very very uh, irritating to those same linings. Um, so there, there are four chemicals and classes and groups of chemicals, because there are lots and lots of variations on them, that you would certainly be concerned about both um, in a space station type environment and, in fact, in your home itself. Well, so what do you do about that? Well, NASA goes ahead and sponsors this uh, extensive piece of research, and they look at whether or not house plants in fact, have any effect at all in terms of purifying and cleaning the air of these toxic chemicals. And it turns out that yes, indeed they do. Um, the, uh, the pores on plants will take up these chemicals along with carbon dioxide, process them, turn most of them quite harmless, release them back uh, into the atmosphere, either broken down or will transform them biologically into oxygen and any of the other components that, that may make up the, uh, uh, the gas. Now, plants also have a really good ability to pick up some of those very, very small particles that uh, we were talking about a couple of sessions ago, the fine particulate matter, the 2.5 micron and below sized particles that as well are very irritating to the respiratory tract because we breathe those in, they go deep into the lungs and they become very inflammatory once they hit um, the general circulation. So what are the plants that happen to be particularly good in terms of cleaning the air? Well, the uh, number one plant turned out to be chrysanthemums. Um, they're uh, attractive plants, so it's nice to have them around. Uh, you can bring them into your house, let them bloom, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the blooms, enjoy the fragrance, and then they can go outside at, uh, at the appropriate time if you want. You, know, you can obviously just keep them around and they'll stay nice and green and leafy and continue to filter the air in your house, and that's just fine. Uh, another common house plant that seems to be particularly good at clearing a number of these um, uh, different toxins, toxic uh, air pollutants, formaldehyde and xylene in its case, is our spider plants. Um, those happen to be particularly good. Dracaena is another family of plant that works on virtually all of the four chemicals that we spoke about, benzene, formaldehyde, ammonia and xylene. Um, there are lots of different species. You can go to the, uh, uh, go to the gardening store, uh, the hardware store, and there will be probably two or three different types of, um, of Dracaena there. Fig plants, fig trees also happen to be particularly good and, and do fairly well indoors. So uh, that's a nice addition. Obviously, it's a much bigger type of plant, um, um, but it's a really good uh, filter. Peace lilies, uh, they have a, a sort of a cup-shaped white flower to them. They also are particularly good, and they, they, um, they will clean the air of a fairly wide range of pollutants. Boston ferns, another common um, indoor plant. They are uh, another good uh, plant. What you're starting to see, however, is that each one of these plants has a slightly different 
uh, requirements so far as sun exposure, so far as watering is concerned and things like that. Now this is uh, not a gardening <laughs> uh, show at all, so we're not really gonna get into that, but typically what you would wanna do is um, create sort of mini environments within your home and group plants that seem to do well together, requiring the same sorts of um, humidity levels and watering frequency and sunlight exposure, things like that. Um, now, I, you can also have, you can also take a slightly different tack if you have rooms that, that have um, areas that are particularly uh, sunny versus other areas of the room that are, that are deeper into shade. Some of the other plants are snake plant or uh, often called mother-in-law's tongue. Uh, we're not gonna editorialize on that at all, but these are very long slender leaves. They do a really good job. Bamboo pines, or I'm sorry, bamboo palms also do uh, a very good job of cleansing the, um, the air and the environment. And last but not least on the list uh, that NASA at any rate uh, uh, examined were aloe vera. And aloe vera plants, in addition to their medicinal qualities and the aloe that comes from them, uh, also happen to be great filters of indoor air. Now the question of course comes, how many plants do I need in order to really have any effect at all on the indoor environment? It was suggested in the NASA uh, research that one of these plants in about a six inch pot, so we're, we're talking about a, uh, not a seedling, but a, a medium sized plant, one plant per hundred square feet of indoor space seemed to be effective in terms of doing the job that, uh, that they were looking for. So if you were talking about a 2000 square foot home, you might want about 20 indoor plants um, uh, in order to, to do a, a fairly good job. I have seen uh, other articles that have suggested that as many as three plants per hundred square feet is required. So, uh, you know, I guess the, I, the the notion with indoor plants is the more the merrier. Uh, indoor plants also, in addition to their filtering, seem to have a very, very positive effect on mood. So if you're, if you want not only a clean environment, but a happy environment in your home, the more the plants, the merrier. Uh, obviously, of course, there comes a price to pay with all of that because somebody has to water them, somebody has to move them around, somebody has to, to deal with all of that. But I think that can be a, uh, a very healthy, enjoyable part of, um, of your lifestyle if you, can, if you are sort of uh, bent in that direction. So those are the... Uh, uh, so the answer to the question, do houseplants really make a difference, is absolutely they do. They can have a very purifying effect on your indoor, the indoor air. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful in that, insofar as some of them can have a little bit of an allergic effect for sensitive people. So you have to be a little bit careful in terms of uh, testing these plants as you bring them in and seeing it, do they have any kind of allergic effect on me or other members of my family, but otherwise they're a great addition to any home. Uh, I'd like to leave you with just a couple of, of thoughts um, in terms of this series that we've done. I think probably the most important, the most valuable tool that, uh, that we've spoken about over these, these uh, 12 presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, is the Healthy Living app that you can get put out by the Environmental Working Group. And you can go on um, to either the Apple Store or Google Play and download the app for free. You can scan using the UPC barcode. You can scan products, find out how they are rated in terms of their environmental impact. Are they safe for you? Are they safe for the environment? And if you find that some of the uh, products that you have are not really all that good for either 
you or the environment, then uh, the database within the Healthy Living app can point you in the direction of finding better alternatives. So it's just a really nice, convenient, easy way of cleaning up a lot of the chemical contamination in your life. And again, the nice thing that I like about it is if left to my own devices, I'm not a chemist, I really can't evaluate a lot of these things. And so I think like most other people, I fall um, under the spell of the marketing uh, designs of people who manufacture products. And so they say all kinds of wonderful things about products being natural and good for the environment. But I have no real way of evaluating that. I don't know, I, I don't know how to separate truth from fiction you know, when it comes to those sorts of things. The Healthy Living app um, put out by the Environmental Working Group is put out by chemists. So it solves that problem. I don't have to become a chemist because a group of dedicated chemists who are uh, coming from the right direction, so far as I'm concerned, in terms of protecting me and the environment, they've done the work for me and they've evaluated these products. And um, because they don't have a conflict of interest through corporate sponsorship, I'm getting pretty accurate information. Now, the um, Environmental Working Group also runs a website, ewg.org, um, pretty simple. And they have uh, just within the last week come out with a new drinking water database. So if you want to see if the drinking water in your area is safe or not, you can go in, enter your area code, and it will pull up a list of the, um, the water, the municipal water supply companies that uh, feed into your neighborhood. Uh, and often it's more than one agency. It'll be a combination of agencies because often they have cross arrangements with each other and uh, purchase water at different times of the year from each other. Uh, but you can see what kind of, you know, whether the, the water is in fact safe and some 40% of the water supply in the United States is not. So uh, it's worth finding out. And it will take, it actually takes it a step further by then showing you uh, what type of filter systems you can uh, employ to deal with those particular contaminants that are problematic in your water supply. So that's a really, really nice um, addition to uh, the, uh, the different uh, environmental types of databases that they run. And they have databases for sunscreen, they have databases for all the packaged and canned food goods in the store. Um, they just have a lot of really nice uh, applications. The other two things that I would advise you to do is number one, don't use antimicrobial soap. It does nothing that regular soap doesn't do. It doesn't protect you any more than uh, just regular Castile soap or the most, the simplest bar soap you can find. Uh, it does pollute the environment. It does uh, contribute to the generation of superbugs. So it's, it's really pointless stuff to have. And then nonstick cookware just simply is a little bit, it's playing with fire. If everything goes right, you're probably okay, but things do go wrong in the world, at least that I live in. So it seems just to be a safe, sound policy to, uh, uh, to eliminate that if you possibly can. I want to thank you all for joining me through this 12-part presentation. Um, I think that, uh, that there are lots and lots of really good positive steps we can all take, and hopefully by doing that we'll all be a little bit safer in what has become a relatively unsafe world. Thank you very much for joining me. Bye now.